Hey, Chad Peterman here, your host of the Can't Stop the Growth podcast, a show that advances the home services industry and beyond. For today's episode, I'm about to pass the mic to our partners at smartac.com for their special monthly series on all things innovation and business. Together, we bring content that empowers you to build a positive, healthy workplace for you, your people, and your bottom line. So let me officially pass the mic to smartac.com for today's episode chock full of insights that you can take and apply to your growth. Now listen and grow. Hello, and welcome to Experience Matters, the monthly series created by and for entrepreneurs and leaders, specifically in the home services industry. Whether you're navigating the integration of cutting edge technology, expanding your team, or aiming to elevate your brand experience, we've got you covered. Each month will bring practical solutions, innovative concepts, and insider knowledge to fuel the growth of your business. Along the way, we'll feature several industry leaders to share their knowledge and insights. We appreciate you being here. Let's get started. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Experience Matters podcast. We are fortunate enough to be part of the Can't Stop the Growth series with Chad Peterman and the Experience Matters podcast. We'll use our unique backgrounds in entrepreneurship, leadership, and innovation to bring you all sorts of fun stories, interviews, facts, features, and uh, just topics we think you'll find useful and entertaining. Uh, my name is Andy Fusile, and I am your host for this episode. Normally, I'm joined by my business partner and co-host, Josh Tickel. But Josh is out on vacation with the family today, so instead, I have a very special guest joining me, um, who I'll tell you about uh, very shortly. So the discussion for today's episode is about the HVAC business in the summer. It's busy, it's chaotic, it's wonderful from a profits perspective, but it can be an absolute grind to get through. So I thought it'd be fantastic to have a true professional like Josh Kelly on the show to help cover this topic. And we're calling this episode Surviving the Summer. All the profits and less of the stress. So let's get started. So a little bit about our guest for today. Uh, this guy is truly a fantastic person. I've only known him for about a year, but I already consider him a close friend. And not only is he a good person, he's a titan of the home services industry, and we're lucky to have him on. So Josh is a forward-thinking executive with a proven record in the history of growing businesses. He's skilled at home services, software, marketing, and public speaking. He's smart, he's witty, he's passionate, he's a husband and a father, and currently running one of the most successful consulting companies in the home services space. Uh, that company is Clover. The man is Josh Kelly. Josh, it's so great to have you here. It's always weird to like have someone, especially a friend, like speak with your bio and you could have just said in just straight simplicity, like we normally have Josh Tico, but we upgraded Josh's this week. So, <laughs> so here you go. <laughs> yeah. I didn't say it. You did. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, I, so it's recorded. It is what it is. <laughs> um, but you know, it is actually nice to have another Josh cause I can just keep saying Josh and nothing changes from previous. <laughs> From the podcast, if they're not really paying attention, it's the exact same two people. And that's the benefit of getting someone with the same name. There were way better guests available, but the names weren't as good. So Yeah, I went through them all. Um, so great to have you. Uh, all right. So let's talk about summer. We are, we're hitting the heat, man. Um, it has started certainly uh, here in Houston where I'm at. I look at uh, uh, different parts around the country where all, all our clients are located. And um, it's starting everywhere. And so I'm, I'm super curious. You're a home services guy at heart. Let's let me in, inside your head for a second. When someone says summer, what what does an HVAC owner think about? What comes to mind? So I'm going to put this in two groups. There's, the, we'll call it the more experienced, sophisticated contractor and most contractors. The more experienced, sophisticated contractor takes a deep breath and goes, people are finally going to leave me alone and I get to work on stuff. Uh, most contractors, his hair is on fire right now, putting out fires left and right every single day. Um, summer is like a mixed bag because it's where we make all of our money. I, I think uh, the stat is uh, 
you know, uh, something like 60 to 70% of all uh, profit is made in the four summer months, May through August for most HVAC companies. Obviously, that's not relative to plumbing or electrical or roofing or whatever, right? But uh, it's a high profit, high revenue area, but it's also, if things are going to break, now's the time. (laughs) (laughs) So you're you're excited for the opportunity, but if you're not prepared, you're stressed. Well, it's, it's, if you're not staffed properly, it's a big deal. If your marketing is not in place, which marketing is less important in the summertime because everybody's busy. If your efficiencies, this is where you're going to have callback issues. This is where you're going to drop the ball the most. Now, and the complication to that too is in the middle of summer, if you discover major problems, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you go to the dance with the person you're with, you're stuck with them now. Whatever systems, processes you have going into summer, Nobody. I mean, if you're a truck and truck, you got two two guys working on underneath you. You're working on a house. You can make major adjustments in the summertime. Although you probably don't. If you have a company of any size, your guys are stressed out. They're wore down. Safety becomes an issue. Exhaustion becomes an issue. Like retention can be an issue, but generally they're working too much. Like there are no major changes that can be made to your business. So, like even something as simple as a price increase like it become very difficult in the middle of summer. So then, so yeah. So when does prep really start for that then? Like when do you, like your, like your clients in Clover, when do you say, okay, now we lock it down and we, and we go with what we got? I mean, in general, it's going to depend a little bit on the market, but it's, it's May, mid May at the very latest, I'm going to lock things down. And, and the reason is not because I don't have more time in some markets, because some markets I do in any given year, that could be true or it could not be true. It depends. But I just, the summer season is when I focus almost entirely on my team and on culture and on driving and, and just keeping doing the blocking and tackling, doing the things that we already have in place. The rest of the year I build things. And at the core in the summertime, I still build things, right? Because I have teams in place and I'm like, I have processes and I have middle management. I have, I have things that not everybody does, but at the end of the day, I don't change anything that can affect the techs. I don't change anything that really even affects the CSRs or dispatching. It's just too complicated to create any additional friction in the summertime, but I'll do stuff on the back end for me. Uh, things like updating and reporting, or, you know, I certainly still doing my normal going through costs and cutting things and trying to increase my efficiency, but I'm not running out a new pay plan. I'm not running out a new accessory program. I'm not running out like, uh, what I came, what I came with, is what I'm running through mid-May at the very latest, usually the beginning of May. So you, you mentioned something interesting there, which is like uh, you're 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 looking at the numbers. How often are you looking at the numbers as you're as you're going through the summer, knowing there's limited tweaks, but there's still you know you're, you're keeping an eye on the business. I mean, at the end of the day, like my my process doesn't change. Now, a smaller business, that's not necessarily the case, but it should be the case. At the core of it, I like my financials. Yeah, I'm checking once a month because at the end of the day, that's a scorecard. That's an after effect. It's a leg effect, right? I can't make changes that's already too late. But my job costing, I'm still doing every single week. My my call center reports, my sales reports, my marketing reports, my all the other stuff is still once a week. And I'm still looking at my DP report every single day, my daily progress. What's my revenue by department compared to my goal so I can react And still hit those goals just because I can't make structural or large changes doesn't mean I can't fill the board or change things or just small things to make sure I hit those numbers and not just hit them, but crush them. Uh, And of course, at the end of the day, we all know this, but some people just don't do great at it. Um, I check my install board multiple times a day. Uh, At the end of the day, if if I could keep, you know, all 50 of my install crews or five for whoever's listening or one or two. You know, that hides a lot of sins. So I'm going to always make sure my install board's full. Uh, and I use, and by the way, I could just share this. I use a simplistic digital install board that is a Google Sheet that's super easy to use. And I'm checking every single day to make sure I am always doing installs because that's how I make the money. So then what are the things, let's go with two categories. During the summer, the tweaks and tunes and the whatever that you mentioned, there can be things you're constantly doing. Let's let's dial in on a few tangible things 
that maybe a small mid-sized contractor can can do that is listening to this um, episode to to help them that maybe they're not you know they're not as used to all the the metrics and the dashboards and all the stuff that you like you've built up over time um, that they might be able to do and then and then we'll change topics and go to the 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 prep right like for next season and all that stuff. There's a lot of small things I could do so. You know, I'm still recruiting. I'm still driving efficiency. I'm still checking my, make sure my pricing, my basic pricing rise by doing job costing. I'm still uh, trying to keep my warranties down. Uh, but the core of it, the most of what I'm doing in the summer months are not process driven things. Like, and I'm a process driven person, uh, but in the summer, it's people driven almost exclusively. Like, I, I try to put myself – now, I, I did installs back when I was younger and I've done ditches and all that stuff. And I remember what it's like. Like, come June, like, you're already exhausted. July, man, you could barely wake up each day. And, like, that's when mistakes happen. That's when issues happen. That's when things can – you know, safety issues happen. And yes. you just stop doing the shit that you're supposed to do every time. They stop wearing their shoe covers because every house they walk into is going to buy anyway. Right, and they stop doing the I notices, and they stop uh, presenting the three options properly, and they stop talking about financing because every customer is a yes, and it builds bad habits that I have to make up for. And at the core of it, the systems, the processes that I put in place, I make sure continue to happen during the summer because it's not that they get lazy. That's not what. I'm, now that may be true of some technicians, that may be true of some installers, but overwhelmingly, it's just because they're tired. They're just wore down. It's a long, dragged out season. And they have to be aware that, like, even when you're super busy, that's when it's the most important time to do the basic stuff. Because that repair that we're doing in the summer, that's the reason we get the install in six months, right? Creating that amazing experience, following through, doing all the basics. And if I do a poor job now, I still get the yes, I still get the sale. I don't get the next call. I don't build that fence around the customer. I don't get that five-star review. I don't get that referral. And that's what drives the business. So it's it's just hyper-focusing on the really basic things and everything you've been preaching for the last – in Phoenix, like there's really only one season, but lots of places are too, right? But those in-between seasons, all those things I'm talking about and driving and creating and following up with, now I'm just like hyper-building momentum and positive influencing and – and just creating a lot of excitement and experience because because I know at the core of it, they're wore down. So I better be a positive, exciting force because they're not going to be. So you mentioned a couple of things there, and I've got to I got to do a quick plug. You mentioned building a fence. Uh, a, a, a huge percentage of the clients that we work with will give away memberships with the new installs, and they're including our technology on it as a monitoring thing, and it's a way to you know have an ongoing relationship, and that varies from two to five years. Well, it's not just that. That's all true. And like, obviously, I'm a big fan of Smart AC and what you guys are doing. Um, transparency. I'm on your guys' advisory board, right? That's, I like to be upfront about shit. I got talked, I, I, I was so, I liked it so much, I tried to work with them. But um, it, it's not just the, the creating a better experience. That's entirely true. And it definitely does that. But at the same time, what I want to do is create the habit because it's like a car tune up, right? Everybody knows that you should get your car trimmed up, right? It's just a fact. Like you could ask 100 people and they would 99 would say, yeah, I'm supposed to get one. And you ask those 100 people who does, like two of them get them, right? So even though you know you're supposed to get one, you don't do it. Why don't you do it? Because it's just you just don't value it that much. You don't care that much. And, and the biggest thing is because the habit's not built. So when I do a new install and I do those maintenances and I create that experience, I'm creating the habit that this is expected and that could continue the rest of our relationship. I think that's a very fair point. And if you if anybody reads anything about habit building, it's difficult and it takes repetition. But once you're on the other side of it, um, then you appreciate the habit that you have built for yourself, right? All right. So then give me the give me the okay, put your owner hat on. You're going in the summer. Whatever you've been doing is probably more in the business, in the details and whatever, at this point, you're the, you know, you're the fire captain, right? Like you got to make sure everything's happening. How do you elevate yourself to a place where more of some of the mundane get delegated 
to people on the team? How, how do you, does your role shift a little bit as you move into the summer? Yes, to a point. Um, and I don't know if I'm the greatest example, but I'll just put the owner hat of like most contractors because I think that's probably more valuable. Um, yes, your role shifts because most of the time, like most most owners are firefighters. They're not fire preventers and they should be fire preventers. Like it's okay sometimes to let things burn so they never light fire again, which is a hard thing to do. Uh, in the middle of summer, most become pure firefighters and that's not healthy. Like they shouldn't be doing that. But what they should be doing during the off season is really like thinking ahead, what we're going to need, what what's the goals, where are we going, and working on future issues, right? In the middle of the summertime, I kind of throw out – outside of my revenue and profit stuff, I kind of throw out my future initiatives unless it could be just me involved. And I hyper-focus on no building. Like I just am not going to create new things during the busy season. All I'm doing is I become like a – I become like a nuisance to my team where I just check on the most basic shit all the time. But that's what it takes to be effective. And it's not like I'm not handling customer complaints. I'm not, you know, upset technician. Like I got team members for that. At any given time, it could work its way up to me. But I always tell people like, you want to save myself some time, like whatever they ask for, that's what I'm going to give. So why don't you save me the phone call and you just give it to them. But um, I, I end up just really just, being a cheerleader for the team in the summertime. And I end up, I end up just like almost stop planning to a point. Like I don't, yeah. I don't solve future problems. I only focus on making sure the things that we have in place to solve future problems are still being done now. So my mindset shifts a lot. It just, I can't overwhelm the team and I can't, I can't tire them out more than they already are. Uh, and I know that. So my process becomes much simpler. And at the core of it, like if you're really set this up well and you're not out in the field, this is the time where I get to t- take a deep breath. When call volume drops, like that's when everybody's at my door, right? When all oh, the techs aren't making as much money, you know, hey, the install board's not as full, right? This is when I get involved in everything. When everything's going well, which like to be clear, I'm leaking like crazy everywhere money, people, calls, um, but I have more than I can handle. People tend to n- leave me alone for stuff like that. All right. Well, I'm picking up a couple different angles that I want to probe in on because you're you're both being the cheerleader, which means you're giving your energy to make sure the rest of the team is going, right? So you're pouring yourself into everything happening. Yeah. And, and I do that year round, but I really do it in the summertime. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, guys are in 120 to 150 degree attics. They're working ex- extreme days. I mean, here in Phoenix, it, it would not be unusual to have 180, 200 degree attics. And they're doing it day after day. It's not pleasant. I've, I've been, I remember this is, this is not an exaggeration. That is a true story. And I was younger, so don't judge me too hard. But I was doing the install and it was an attic access in a carport. So I'm outside the moment I get out of the attic, right? I went up the attic and I was dumb and I just broke apart the old system entirely. I'm really only supposed to be up there 15, 20 minutes at a time and keep coming in and out, right? Um, but I just was on a roll and I just uh, banged it out in probably 45, 50 minutes, right? Took the whole thing down. I walked down the ladder. It's 105 outside. And I start shivering. I'm so cold. I knew, I knew that's what was coming. I've been there. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. And it's like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's like first thing in the morning. I'm like, I don't know how to tell you this. I have to go. I have to go take a nap in the van, guys. Um, but it's it's just it's so easy to overwork them and not appreciate them. And they already – it's physically tolling. It just is. And it's mentally tolling because it's physically tolling. And, you know, they don't get to spend as much time with their families. And it, it, it's a hard spot to be in for them. And if you're not hyper aware of that and really trying to bridge that gap the best you can, you won't lose them this summer, but you won't get them to refer people to you either. And they won't be bought in all the way. And they won't be excited when they bring up the next cool thing. Um, there's long-term damage to short-term decisions. That's, a, that's an incredibly <laughs> insightful point. And then, I, you know, couple that with if you've got kids and you're in that situation, 
that's often some of the only time that you can do any vacation. That's not just a weekend. And if, if that is your busy season, you're wearing that while you're on the job. You're knowing you, this is like when I'm making my money, but this is also, I'm not taking my kids where I want, you know, I'm not spending that time with them in the vacation. So the, like, that's a, that's a tough thing to know that that is your busy season every season. I, I forget where I originally heard it, but my, my father harps it now, but I, he got it from somewhere. I forget where it is. Maybe I don't know who it was, but it's as a technician, you spend the first five years of your career trying to become a really amazing technician. And then you spend the rest of your career trying to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's, I think, I think that's, uh, that's accurate. That's accurate. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't have the firsthand experience you have. I've been fortunate enough over the last five to six years to work very deeply with a lot of companies. And so I get to know them and, and, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, one of the, one of the things that a lot of different companies put in place is that they try to put it in progression plans so that technicians have a place to go in air conditioning, like in their career. And I think that's, I think that's really valuable. No, I agree. You have to have at the end of the day, it's not just for them wanting to be out of that position, but if you don't have a way, a lot of companies is like, well, I've got 20 technicians. I got one service manager, but you should have team leads. That's not even the point. Like, that service manager job does not come up very often. And there's not upward mobility for them, at, at least a reasonable chance if they're high performers, you'll lose them. And uh, everybody knows how expensive losing the right guy is. Or right gal or right guy, it doesn't matter, right? But um, you spend so much money and effort trying to find them and so much effort to keep them. And when you bring in someone new, it's... It's a painful process and it's a lot of times it's okay, but when it's the right guy and you lose him because you didn't give him upward mobility or connection or any of those reasons, it, it, it's really painful. And I don't, I don't like living through pain if I can avoid it. How, how much time would you spend, not necessarily during the summer, but during the, the year trying to have some of those, you know, one-on-ones with the, with the techs in the field or the people that are out there that are, you know, suffering in the summer that about what they want, how you as an organization are, are trying to work to give it to them? Well, let me answer it this way because like, I'm not a good example of that because I own businesses across the United States and I work at scale, right? So the answer for me is none. Um, but that's because I instead you know, do that one-on-one time with managers and owners right. and it's a different process. But as a service tech, you need to have those connection points. You got to remember that people come for opportunity and money, but that's not the reason they stay. The reason they stay is because relationships. If you have your best friend in the business or a group of friends or something that feels like a family or a mentor, that's the reason people stay. It is not because uh, how many people have you heard in this industry? Guys leave for 50 cents a more an hour and it turns out, they actually make like 25 grand less because they never did the math. You know what I mean? Like people will jump ship if you don't have the relationships built. So at the core of that, I use that with team leads or if it's a small enough team, a supervisor. If if you have a team of 10, then it's you. You're the owner. That's the relationship you have. And you got to spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, But someone has to have those relationships. So at least an hour every single week, one-on-one. So so let's pivot a little bit to where you spend your time, right? Because – you're the coach behind the coach, right? Like the, the guys that are running the business are, are out there, they're pouring their effort and they're building the relationships, doing all that. And, and then you're the guy behind them. What do you stress for those guys to keep it together? It's not one size fits all because every contractor, just like every person has different skills and different weaknesses, right? So in general, in the summertime, I tend to lean into their strengths. During the slow season, I try to bring up their weaknesses because just like – Just like a technician, it's easy to wear them down in the summer too. So I try to focus on more positivity and more systems and processes that alleviate pressure from them in the summertime. And during the slow season, that's when we we go in and we fix the business in general, right? So I run the same cadence that they do in a way. Yeah. What's the recovery period? Let's come off the summer for a second. You're you're coming down. It's September, uh, end October. Temperatures are drifting down. What's What's that look like? Not very long, not very long. 
So a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to take September off. I was like, no, you're not. Um, because that's when people start panicking, right? Like, I can't tell you. I've been in this industry, like, you know, over 20 years now, which is crazy. I'm getting old. Not the point. Um, what happens in the slow season is that's when the leadership team really needs to be there. That's when they need to have those touch points, communications effect. And it doesn't matter if you talk to it blue in the face. I cannot tell you how many times technicians that come to me is like, oh, my gosh, I, I'm not going to pay my rent this month. It's like, you know, the business slows in September. How are you not paying your rent? You're still making a lot of money. You're just not making July numbers. And they figure they start making July numbers. That's their new every single month, right? No matter how many times you say it, new techs do that. No matter how many times you say it, a business owner has been in business 25 years in the space, has an HVAC business, come September, calls me panicking about where the calls went. I was like, well, the weather dropped. So the calls, you're going to have to go get the calls. Like, how do I get the calls? I'm like, what did we do last September? I was like, oh, uh, we did this, 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 this. It's like, yeah. Go do that. <laughs> it's very predictable. Like this happens every year. <laughs> All right. Well, then let's do a couple of uh, should do's and shouldn't do's. Give me some of the the things that you should be doing. And I'll rattle off a few topics here and you just grab onto something you want to talk about. Uh, time management, process and systems, creating transparency, setting and keeping priorities, like if, if you've got someone in front of you for 15 to 20 minutes and you see the panic in his eyes, like, you know, uh, what, what are what are some of the things you're going to talk about? So, so once again, every business owner is slightly different. They have different strengths and weaknesses. Sure. But in general, the very first place I always start is transparency and reporting because most people panic because they don't really know what's happening. Right. And if you know what's happening, most people are pretty good at critically thinking, at least coming up with some ideas, maybe not the perfect idea, uh, but they can, they know how to tackle it and they can work towards something. They struggle when they don't really understand why something's happening or how something's happening. And with solid reporting, that becomes a thing of the past. Now, there's still some like trial and error how to solve stuff, but. You know, if my average ticket goes down, I know exactly why it is. It's because they stopped selling accessories. It's because we stopped doing I know it's most of wise. It's because we stopped doing the health and safety checks. It's because like there's a list of things that's very trackable for me, very easily identifiable. And there's clear metrics that the numbers end up getting affected by it. If my average ticket goes down and I am just like, oh, shit, my guy stopped selling it. And I have no idea why. Very hard to fix and becomes a lot of causes a lot of anxiety and panic, right? I don't like businesses that cause anxiety. I like businesses to be fairly predictable, right? If I put in this much money and this much time and effort, I should receive this much money back. Uh, and that's that's how most businesses are run. That's how really good home service businesses are run too. It's a little complicated because it's a people-driven business, but it still applies. Once I have that in place, then it, it usually becomes – how are we prioritizing this and how are we working on this? Are we actually getting things completed? Are we keeping things simple? Are we keeping things scalable? And what's our follow through process and how do we make sure it's ingrained in culture? It becomes more process driven than anything else. But and then even contractors, I know contractors that are super creative, super effective, but at certain times they just try to do everything and by doing everything, they end up completing nothing. And that becomes right. a time management issue and a prioritization issue. Um, at the end of the day, you could really only effectively do three or four things at a time. And even that is a high level person. Most contractors, you know, and I'm not calling anyone out, but like, I'd rather you do two things than five things. But right. when I say that, like, do them all the way, take them until it's ingrained in culture and it happens every time without exception. That's way more valuable than doing every doing five things 70% of the way. So you, you've got, I mean, you've got thousands of, of, of contractors you work with, right? And you obviously not individually, you've got a, a massive team and organization helping. Uh, but but I'm, I'm all, always curious what the makeup of that owner looks like, right? Like, cause you, you hear the, you hear the story of start out as a technician and worked his way up and then got to a point where he wanted to start his own shop and then jumped over and he, he lateraled and he's got very little business skills, but, but all the know-how in the field. And then you have people that, that 
jump into it, right? They like they're like, hey, this is a good business to be, and I'm going to buy it, and I have no HVAC experience, but I'm like, if you had to break down just like a pie chart of the people you work with, like, what does that actually look like for you? Well, I don't know what the actual percentage is, but the vast majority worked in the industry at some point decided they could do it better than the person they worked for or just had always had that goal and then went in themselves. Yeah. That's the vast majority. It's becoming more and more common for people without experience to hop into this industry. But historically, I mean, and even that, even now, like it's always been a great business. It's, you know, recession resistant. It's COD, which is a huge deal, right? Uh, if you're doing residential, there's a ton of opportunity and, and a ton of houses. It's a large market with high demand where you can charge good pricing. It's sexy on paper, but it's not a sexy business. No one is excited to do this, right? At the core of it, even all of us contractors, like we like it because the lifestyle it creates and the experience that we could have and the teams we could take care of, but no one really likes replacing toilets. So historically, it's almost exclusively people that have been in the industry and then saw how valuable it could be. If I had to guess, it's like 98% that way and 2% the other way. Wow. So then, I mean, well, obviously it, that there's the reason that the multitude of consulting and success like driven businesses exist for helping, like right? Cause you're, you're a guy that spent, let's say five to eight years perfecting a craft and, and you've got an entrepreneurial bug that's always been just there. Right. And you've got risk tolerance and you're like, Hey, I could do this. And you turn to your wife one day and you say, Hey, I'm going to do this. We're going to open it up. It's going to be me. You're going to do the books. <laughs> we're going to hang out our sign and we're going to go at it, right? What is What sort of a business gap does that create for you to step in and be like, hey, you know every single thing about this box, but what you're doing now has nothing to do with- the box is the least important That's part. right. That's the least, that's the, that, 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 that doesn't matter, right? <laughs> It matters, but it's the least important. No. Yeah. No, no it, it happens all the time. Um, in, in general, I do work with people who kind of just start up. That tends not to be the ones that I – because that's a smaller percentage of contractors, right? It's a very small percentage. And those people tend not to be that growth-oriented because they just don't know yet. So they're not looking for help because they don't understand what they – you don't know what you don't know. Uh, it tends to be after you've done this a few years and you're not growing the way you think and you're not making the money that you should be making and you're starting to really get frustrated with certain simple things in your business not going right, that's when people tend to reach out and get help. It's maybe not the smart way of doing it, but that's the way most people do it. So at the core of it, like if you know how to do service, really, we're in an industry that this is the most beautiful part about this whole industry and which makes it so sexy. But uh, I know contractors out there I swear to God, I'm amazed they could tie their shoe every day. But they run, you know, eight figure businesses. They're doing 10 million or more, right? And all you have to do in this industry to be really successful, to do 10 million. Like to be 50 million, you have to be an operator. To be 10 million, you could just be really great at service. Or you'd be really great at sales. Or you could be really great at marketing. You could be really great at capitalizing the customers you already have. You could do just one of those things and be almost not terrible, but not good at the other things. And you can have a $10 million business that, you know, you clear a million and a half to $2 million in profit a year, which by any normal person's standards is a ton of money. I mean, I'm setting up my LLC right now as you're, as you're describing this to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, this, is, this is a real thing. Like people that work next to the business, like adjacent to the business, like yourself or, yeah. you know, people work for digital marketing firms. Like so many of them jump ship and end up becoming contractors because they just see how much opportunity there is. It happens all the time. And and it's not like um it's not like a casino where like for me to win, they have to lose. It, there is more than enough business for everyone to go around. So it's not like it's not like if another contractor in Phoenix or in Denver or in Tucson or out in Jacksonville, like are having a lot of success. It doesn't mean that I have less success. That's just not how it works. It's too big an industry. And at the core of it, there's more demand than we can all handle, um, especially in the summertime. Now during the slow season, yeah, we fight for, for business that we have, but in the busy season, like I could tell you exactly how much revenue you're going to do almost to the T and it does not have to do with your marketing. It's just your production availability. How many crews do you have? How many salespeople do you have? How many techs do you have? I could tell you about how much revenue you're going to do. 
because everyone's going to have their board full in the summertime. It just yeah. is what it is. All right. I want to, I'm going to rapid fire you on a few things. All right. Quick facts. Like you're going into the summer, right? It's your checklist. It's May. It's, you know, here we are already June. So it's still applicable though, for a lot of places in the country. Um, what are you telling your clients on hires, marketing, installer ads? Where, where are you going across right now, knowing what's about to happen and happening? Yeah. I mean, always hire, like, especially in the summertime. Like, I don't want to cut too many people in, in the off season, but I'll find a way to keep them busy. So if I find a great guy, you hire him, period. So that one's fairly easy. Um, marketing, I switched the marketing entirely. Like, I, I still see it sometimes. It just blows my mind. They're doing like tune up offers. Like, I don't even want to do a tune up in July. Like, what are you doing? Um, and I switch almost all the install offers. I go after my high ticket or other services. So, plumbing or electrical, uh, I'm trying to create business there. Cause at the end of the day, my business is going to be self fulfilled. I watch my marketing too to turn things off. Like, I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to a contractor. And they're booked out like three straight days, yet they're spending their PPC budget is the same. Yeah. It's like, well, are you closing any of those? No, we can't we can't take them. It's like maybe you shouldn't spend the money. Um, you can turn it back on tomorrow if you need to. Um, so it's just really the basic and the tracking and the following up. Um, all this stuff is fairly common sense. It, it, it's not complicated. Always, always be hiring. Worst case scenario is I can replace my worst guys. I get why you say it's common sense. You, you've had 20 years experience. But when you're in the trenches, it is so easy to forget the easy. Well, I mean, what you end up doing is you end up working on the thing that's right in front of you, right? And that's all you see. You're, and and when, you, when you do that, you miss a lot, right? <laughs> but if you were to able to pull yourself out, and, and here's, here's the truth, right? There is such a benefit to outside perspective. And if you could train your mind to be objective, which is very hard to do, like you've known me for a long time, I'm crazy objective to a fault yeah. sometimes, right? If you could think objectively, you could walk a contractor that does a million dollars and that business, you know, clears a half a million. So not, or not half a million, but clears 50,000, right? It's not a well run business, right? And if that's you listen to this podcast, you could fix it. Don't hear anything like against you. Uh, but not a well-run business. They could walk into a $25 million business and they could find five opportunities that are leaving on the ground, walking past every single day. You just can because you're not in the business, hyper-focused on the things in front of you that they just like have become numb to because they're just used to it. So if you're, if you're one of those guys, right? Like let's say there's some percentage of the people you work with, they have trouble zooming out. What do you do? What do you tell them? What's your coaching for those people is it a, is it a daily? Is it a weekly? Like how, how do you tell them and you know, what do you put in place with them either from accountability standpoint or just a daily practice standpoint? Like what, what is it that you say, you need to do this for this reason. We both realize it's good. Go. Yeah. So it's a combination of a few things. The first thing is still the reporting because reporting is objective. So there's no way around that. So do that. Number two, a lot of people, the reason people hyper-focus on things is because they stopped growing at the same pace that they should be. So creating a process where you're constantly learning and absorbing things from other people. And if I really need to shake somebody and get them to, to see things objectively, the best thing I could do is to force them to go visit another shop. See what is possible, what's different. And just like them seeing those other issues makes them realize like how much they know and how much they could do if they were objective in their business and helps them see like what things at scale look like. Cause sometimes it's like people say, I can never run a $10 million business. And they go into $10 million business. I'm like, that's not any different than my business. I'm like, yeah, no, I know you could do this. This is within your capabilities for sure. All right. Then that's so pivot. We're, we're, we're running low on time, but I want to get to this. You've got to have this in your back pocket. I know, which is like, what are the things not to do? Let me address this two ways. There's things that bug me that are going to piss me off. And there's very few things that upset me. But like, if you tell me the reason that we're doing something is because that's why the way we used to do stuff, that doesn't, that doesn't feel good for me. Um, that's for me personally. Um, and then, you know, keep in making the same mistakes and never learning. That drives me nuts. Um, from a contractor standpoint, like the things just not to do, there's a lot of things that just not to do. But the, the key to it is 
to not make the same mistakes. And for summer specifically, don't rock the boat. But where most contractors get in trouble, and I have a, a good buddy, his name is Brett out of Tucson, is a uh, partner of mine. And he talks about the figure eight of death, which I had to break him of the habit. But the figure eight of death was, hey, this thing's not working, not working, not working. Holy shit, it doesn't work at all. We're in big trouble. And then we spend time, mind, and energy on how to fix it. And it gets better and better and better. Oh, it's completely fixed. So we stop doing the thing that fixed it. And then it starts going back down. We get all the way to the bottom. We go, oh, shit, what are we going to do? And they try to come up with a new idea on how to solve the problem. But we already know how to solve the problem. Just go continue to do the thing that worked the first time. So most of it's just good habit of like you can make a lot of mistakes and mistakes are only a problem if you don't adjust and learn from them. I mean, I think, I think the core of that, the simplicity of that is most people don't document, like they don't have a pro- uh, project management system or process in any way, which is a mistake. So they don't document what issues they've had and how they solved them. So, you know, that when that problem comes up six months ago, you don't even remember what you did to fix it. So how are you supposed to do that? I think that's a lot of the reason why people do that is because they're they're not doing that. And at the core of it, when I fix something, like I know I'm the moment I think I have it right, I'm 90 days away from doing it terrible, right? So like there is no while we're doing it right. It's always we're just doing it better than we were before. I still need to check on this every third days. Like it cannot go away. Like if you think you could just train, teach them a sales process, then – Wipe your hands of it. They're good now. They get it. Good luck. You are 90 days away from them doing zero sales. Uh, so I, I want to close out with this one topic. Uh, we'll call it accountability. What I have realized in my career, the further I progressed, far, you know, further I gotten, as experience and wisdom, you know, builds, you somewhat feel less of a sense of accountability because you can draw on your own experiences. However, <laughs> The one thing that I have realized is if I do not have that accountability, you do not continue to progress in the way that you want to progress, right? And can. And so I have to imagine just because I'm an entrepreneur, right? Like I've, I've gotten to a point and growing businesses and all that stuff and you feel good about it and you're proud. You've got these clients, right? These guys have just literally busted their butt over 5, 10, 20 years and they are good. They're really good. If they don't maybe have that sense of accountability, Ability that they have to answer to someone because they know most of the answers. Yet the second you talk to somebody else for five or 10 minutes, you slap your head and you go, and ah, you're right. I should have been doing that. Right. How do you teach that? How do you teach that into your, into your clients? So complicated answer to a fairly simple question. For me, that's not really a problem. No one in the United States is like, if they're coming to me and talking to me, it's because they want some form of accounting pushback or they, they want to continue to grow. I actually don't think accountability is the core issue there. I don't disagree that that happens regularly, but there's a reason it happens. And that's like tackling, uh, tackling the symptom instead of the cause. I think the cause at the core of it is they got comfortable, right? They wanted more, but they didn't really want more because they didn't want to do the work that was associated with more. They want to hire that extra person. They want to put in middle management because that seems stressful. So they're going to stay where they're at and they're going to always complain that they wanted more, but they just couldn't get it. But in truth, they just didn't want to do the work that's associated. So I I go back to this. uh, Roadrooter used to have this growth strategy. It was incredibly effective. Um, And Roadrooter is the largest plumbing company in the United States uh, by far uh, and used to be much larger, much more successful when they ran this just the way I'm describing. But whenever a location is slow, the concept was called it's not the man or it's not the land, it's the man. Meaning if they, uh, I'm originally from Cincinnati, which it wears rubber is headquartered, but if there was Cincinnati and that shop grew to 8 million and then it started stagnating, it started not growing, what they would do is they would split up to an East Cincinnati and a West Cincinnati. And you would take the current you know, manager or GM and you move it to one, and then you create a new GM. And what happens inevitably is they're comfortable at $8 million in size. That's where they are happy, they're satisfied, and they, they know how to get there. So that $8 million shop became two $4 million shops, and that $4 million shop almost instantaneously goes back to $8 million because that's the comfort level of that GM. And the other one is a $4 million shop, and they grow their own comfort level. And as soon as they become stagnant, they split again. 
Now there's a north and a south, right? And they keep doing this process over and over. And what they discovered is the biggest reason businesses don't grow, it's not accountability, it's not intelligence, it's not market, it's not your competition, it's the comfort level of the person in charge. So there's two ways to solve that, right? Number one is awareness, right? That, hey, I'm feeling comfortable. And to be clear, it's okay to be comfortable. If you're doing 5 million, 10 million, 25 million, and you're happy where you're at, only a jerk would tell you that's not good enough. Like it just like you're a wealthy person compared to 99.9% right. of the United States. But at the core of that, if that's where you are, then don't tell people like me that you want to grow because then I'm going to make you grow. And that's not a pleasant right. experience for either one of you, for either one of us, right? Like I want people who actually want to grow, not people who verbally say they want to grow. The second thing is just involve yourself with high, higher producers. Like, if you go out there and you see what's possible, what's realistic, and how to get there, that becomes contagious. And so having conversations like me, with me sometimes is a real eye-opener for a $50 million business. It's certainly an eye-opener for a million or $2 million. And sometimes going that million, $2 million, going and visiting that $10 million shop becomes a gigantic eye-opener, right? When you – most of the time I think people get comfortable is because they don't really understand – what they're not doing to get to the next level. Cause what got you here won't get you there. And having those conversations, seeing it in action, uh, learning the process and the systems and, and just focusing on momentum and small and incremental improvements, right? Like that's how you prove that. And I think the accountability at the end of the day, a lot of times is just a symptom of, I don't really want more cause I'm happy where I'm at and that's okay. So I don't need to hold myself accountable, right? Because if, if someone was really driven and really excited and they were at 5 million and they honestly were going to do everything they could to get to 25 million, there's already accountability there. They're going to do it. And they're going to call people like me and they're going to get that extra level of accountability where they have all the answers. So now they don't have excuses and they got somebody that is going to hold them accountable when they said they'd love that idea and they're going to roll it out and they didn't, right? So... I think it's the comfort level that's the problem. It's not accountability. So accountability is a part of it. And if you're seeking accountability, I think that's a good thing because you want someone to push you. But really, you're talking about curiosity, motivation, interest to learn, desire to grow. You're talking about, you're talking about qualities of, of someone who wants uh, to be more. And be more doesn't necessarily mean make more money. It just means grow. But I think here's the thing. I think... If you can uh, foster those qualities, money comes. Yeah, it becomes inevitability. It, it's yeah, right. if you chase. And I had an old mentor, and he passed away way too young, but he he taught me this. And at the core of this, I want everyone to hear me say this before I say it. His little quote, but like everyone says they understand it, but I could tell you, it took me to a place where I didn't need money for me to really understand it, which is sad all internally. And I had thought I understood it for a long time, and I actually didn't. But he used to, his quote was, if you chase money, money will run from you and you become its slave. If you chase a purpose, money will run to you and it becomes your slave. And I, I understood that as like, don't chase money. At the same time, I was making decisions to chase money. Now I make decisions that financially make no sense. Like, I'll absolutely do that for you. No problem. No, I'm not going to charge you. It's the right thing to do. Right. And when I do the right thing consistently over time and help people without asking for anything in return and drive people and help them succeed in their lives and their businesses and everything, like opportunities just show up on my door from three, you know, three variables away from that person that they mentioned to one person, you to answer the person. And then someone just shows up at my door and says, hey, I need to partner with you. At the core of it, that's how we met. For everyone out there, if you don't know who Clover is, find out. If you don't know who Josh Kelly is, find out. If you don't know who Laura Kelly is, his amazing wife, um, find out. They they run an amazing business. They do amazing things for people. They change people's lives. I'm not just saying that. Um, I've got to know this man at a serious level, um, and uh, they're good people. They'll help you in your business. They'll help you in your life. They'll help you who you are. So uh, please reach out and figure out how you can how you can grow your purpose how you can increase your curiosity, motivation, accountability, all the stuff. And uh, 
I think that's that's all we got for now. Josh, I cannot thank you enough, man. This was awesome. Yeah, see, it's the upgrade of the Joshes, I'm telling you, man. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to get connected, you can find me at chadmpeterman.com. To see what our team's up to, you can visit petermanbros.com. As always, keep growing out there.